on the 29th day of October, Halloween gave to me 29 used cars killing, 28 James Woods smoking, 27 maggots squirming, 26 phone booth lunches, 25 cotton candy cocoons, 24 space vampire snogging, 23 bloody canoes, 22 pool corpses, 21 groovy ashes, 20 Japanese giallos, 19 kung fu vampires, 18 haunted marches, 17 eternal lonelinesses, 16 cursed VHS tapes, 15 spectral snapshots, 14 mothers murdering, 13 prices bleeding, 12 models dying, 11 Bettys baking, 10 prices burning, 9 seagulls pecking, 8 scientists sneaking, 7 gold ones shooting, 6 psychic scamming, 5 naked witches, 4 alien spelunking, 3 UFO abductions, 2 deputy so-and-sos, and a masked hawk being creepy. <laughs> Well, hello there, Halloweenies, Halloweeneries. I don't know. We should come up with a name for that. Uh, uh, drop by Discord. Let me know what the name should be for people who listen to all of these 31 Days of Halloween episodes. Um, there's only a handful left, obviously. Uh, this is the 29th of October. So, first of all, I hope you are having uh, a tremendous Saturday. This is uh, the day that most people are going to be out trick-or-treating. Um, look out for Plymouth Furies, obviously, if you are out there trick-or-treating uh, either yourself or, or with kids. And uh, I would like to start off by saying not only is this part of the Stephen King retrospective, this is the only uh, John Carpenter movie on the list this year, which feels a little light in the Carpenter realm, but what are you going to do, right? Like Christine is a movie that, um, isn't often talked about among Carpenter's best. And I'm going to probably reveal myself to be a bit of a fanboy uh, of Christine, both as a book and as a movie here, but that's okay because I'm going to delight in all things Christine during this conversation. Uh, even though it's, it's not considered one of his major works, I think it's, really good and Carpenter himself in fairness um, did this movie after the failure of the thing this movie you know came out the year after the thing the the thing didn't do well uh, Carpenter was looking for another project to do he was gonna do Firestarter and that was taken away from him because of uh, the the failure of the thing which you know one of those things that's hard to wrap your head around is that one of the great horror films of all time uh, was sort of a critical and financial disappointment. But, oh, uh, well, what are you going to do? Um, you know, the thing is, m maybe my favorite movie of all time, depending on the day you ask me. Uh, it, it's just the best. And, and I, you know, I don't think there's anyone that really argues that it's one of John Carpenter's best movies, if not his best movie. You know, a lot of people love uh, the original Halloween or Escape from New York or They Live. I mean, you know, there's... There are contenders, but uh, Big Trouble in Little China, I would argue, is among his finest work, uh, just because it's such a unique vision of a film. So, regardless, uh, Christine, not often mentioned in that group, but I think it's one of the most straightforward, incredibly competent, and that may be damning with faint praise, but it's just really good. And, and it's good from, I think, start to finish. And it's hard for me to divorce the book and movie in some ways. Because I had read uh, Christine a number of times. I've still got behind me on the shelf if, as I, I uh, talk about the movie. There's a hardback of Christine that I've had for, you know, 30 years. Whenever the book came out, I got a first uh, a first edition of it. Uh, and and have had it ever since. Um, it it's a terrific book. It and even in the Stephen King oeuvre, it's kind of a lesser novel, you know. It it, it because it's a schlocky premise, right? It's <laughs> here is a haunted car, uh, what um, kills people, uh, you know, who do it wrong, and it's kind of a silly idea. And I think Carpenter has said as much that. You know, hey, I did this movie because it was a movie I had to do. The premise was a little silly. But, I, it, you know, he's clearly not 
uh, no pun intended, asleep at the wheel in directing this movie. Because, for one thing, he did the music, uh, or, or, you know, co-wrote the music, and it's a great Carpenter score. Um, and more than that, the, it, it's uh, beautiful to look at. There's a lot of lens flare going on in Christine, which I'm totally fine with. I know, you know, J.J. Abrams got a drubbing for the lens flare in uh, his Star Wars film, but I don't, I don't care. Again, I think that uh, the use of it in this movie, there. So a lot of Christine is about nostalgia, right? You know, the the old music used. It's an old car. All of that stuff. And in a way that is somewhat prescient and certainly relevant these days, there is a a criticism, I think, of nostalgia, of of the haunting quality of nostalgia, if you will, um, that, you know, that it's corruptive to some extent, um, that you can't live in the past. And, and, you know, there's obsession, themes of of obsession and that kind of thing. But... um, it is, uh, I, I think, relevant in a lot of ways because of that. But, you know, let's get to the the, the meat of this. A um, couple of, of, of other notes before we jump into plot. Alan Howarth, uh, Howarth perhaps, um, also co-wrote the music here. And, and he was, you know, working with John Carpenter on things like Escape from New York and Halloween 2 and... Big Trouble in Little China and Prince of Darkness. And, you know, he, he one of the guys who helped to realize John Carpenter's musical vision. Um, and then you have Don Morgan as the cinematographer, um, who is, by the way, the same cinematographer who did the movie Seven. And, uh, you know, what else? Oh, my goodness. Uh, did the TV movie Elvis with John Carpenter, probably where uh, they... Uh, first ran uh, ran across one another. Did Starman, which I think is a great looking movie. And just to be clear, Don Morgan did not um, uh, w- was not DP on Seven, but he was he was on the crew. Um, he's done a, a, a ton of of television work, um, but I think Christine looks amazing. I think it's a, a one of Carpenter's best looking movies, and I think it also benefits because Carpenter tends to be you know, fairly experimental. Uh, he, he certainly likes to play around with uh, some ideas in his movies, and sometimes that can get away from him. You know, I think Prince of Darkness, uh, he says, is, you know, his attempt to do sort of an Italian movie. And that's a movie that I think is really, really interesting, but some of the ideas are not in- entirely well formed. Um, and you know, the movie suffers a little bit from that, uh, big trouble in little China. Even there are moments in that where look, look, I love it. Don't get me wrong. I think big trouble in little China is, is one of the finest in Carpenter's catalog, which means it's one of the finest movies ever. But even that there are moments where you're like, well, we're really going down some alleys here. Um, but Christine is a self-contained story because it, it's a fairly short King novel. Um, it doesn't meander the way that like an it does or bag of bones or, you know, one of his big sprawling, uh, the stand, that kind of thing. It's a handful of characters. It's a pretty simple story of a couple of friends, Dennis and Arnie who, uh, are going to high school. Arnie is a bit of a nerd. He's, he's a little bit put upon, Uh, by some of the local bullies and one day he sees a car uh, that turns out to be the titular Christine uh, 1958 Plymouth Fury and he there's a great line and I think it's it's definitely in the movie and I think it's pulled directly from the book where um, when Dennis is asking him why he bought, he buys Christine because Christine, when, when Arnie first encounters the car is just a rusted heap of junk. And Arnie says, I think it's because for the first time I saw something uglier than me and I knew I could fix her up and I could make her beautiful. And it's kind of a heartbreaking idea is, is that, you know, and again, in the movie, he says, I know what I am. 
and Dennis, who is his friend and a very good friend uh, in, in the in both book and the movie, um, says like, "No, you're fine. You're the, you know you're being hard on yourself." And Arnie is very real about it. Like, "No, no, no. I know who and what I am. I know where my place is in you know this hierarchy of high school and." you know, where I am, uh, you know, both in regards to my parents, you know, his parents kind of run his life and that, you know, Dennis is, you know, I think genuinely a friend to him, but the way that Arnie sees it is that it's a little bit of a charity thing that, you know, Dennis and Arnie grew up together. They really care about one another, but Dennis is a popular guy. He's, you know, on the, on the football team and, he has one of the cheerleaders lusting after him and all of that. And Arnie isn't. Arnie is uh, much more reserved. He's much quieter. He He's a little bit of a loser. Uh, despite the fact that he seems pretty smart. But, um, you know, at that point, nerds... Back in the day, ladies and jelly spoons, nerds were not considered cool in any way. Like, being being the smart guy didn't get you anywhere. And that's what Arnie is. And, uh, so when he sees Christine, he, you know, there's an immediate attraction, uh, to the car and he ends up buying the car for 300 bucks. One of the great scenes in the movie is, uh, where, uh, George LeBay's brother is selling the car and says, you know, I'll take 300 for it. And, uh, or I'm asking 300, but I'll take 250. And, uh, Artie says, whatever you're asking, it, it, it's not enough. And Dennis kind of shakes his head like, oh, Artie, come on, man. You don't want to overpay for this. And and even like Dennis privately says to this old man, like, come on, man, give this kid a break. He, you know, he could buy a much better car for that kind of money. Or, you know, in $1978, uh, a much better car for $250, $300. And... Uh, but the old man kind of understands that the reason Arnie is drawn to it is because of the, the same reasons that his brother was drawn to it, which is something more supernatural, more, more ethereal. And so through the course of the story, obviously Arnie is putting the car back together. He kind of gets involved with the local, uh, garage guy, Darnell, who has him doing some questionable work in the book. There's more of an indication that the work that he's doing for Darnell may not be strictly legal, but, uh, Artie is also set upon by Buddy Repperton and Moochie Welch and a couple of other, you know, high school bullies. And once, uh, Arnie gets Christine put together and gets a girlfriend, a girl named Lee. Um, I think this is one of Alex, Alexandra Paul's first movies who plays Lee in the film. But Buddy Rupperton and his boys go to destroy Christine and do, but uh, Christine will not stay dead. And in maybe the best scene in the movie, it, there's a, a point where Arnie, who you know clearly has this obsession with the car by this point, and that the car has its hooks in him. You know, there's a more than a little bit of a passing nod to the idea that he is a bit addicted to the car and uh, the car is is feeding him um, you know he like Arnie calls it love but it's really something darker than that uh, where Arnie is talking about like how if you take care of something you love it'll it'll uh, be there for you always and although love as he puts it is is ravenous that it, it'll eat you up and again, more of that addiction obsession kind of talk. But um, in in the moment when Arnie finds his car destroyed and it you know is putting it back together late one night in Darnell's garage all alone, he hears the the car kind of repairing itself, and he takes a step back and recognizes like, oh, this car is something more than just a car. And he, Keith Gordon plays Arnie and he, I think he's great in this. And he says, show me. And the car repairs itself. And it's a great set of special effects. The, the effects in Christine are still among the best in any of the Carpenter films. And I'm including the thing like the, the, the technique they use to make this car 
you know, come back to life, that all the dents and everything come uh, repair themselves. I think it just looks so good. It works so well. This is another one, you know, when we talked about The Blob and how uh, a remake of this movie featuring CGI would be just the worst possible idea. You know, just use the same effects uh, you did in this film or the, t the same techniques and, and it looks so good. It look because it's real, right? It's actual, you know, m metal and, and plastic and that kind of thing forming and reforming thanks to reversal photography, but you know, it still works. And, uh, so yeah. So once Arnie knows that Christine, um, is supernatural and, and in many ways unkillable, then, you know, we're off to the races story-wise as Christine starts uh, tracking down and killing, um, you know, the the other bullies that destroyed her. And uh, as well as Darnell, who gets a little too nosy and certainly seems to understand and tries to kill uh, Lee, uh, Alexandra Paul, when uh, she represents a threat to Arnie's affections. And... Uh, then, you know, once the, the bullies start dying, that's when we get uh, Harry Dean Stanton showing up as uh, Junkins, the local police that believes that maybe something is going on that Arnie isn't isn't telling him about. It You know, it's really, really something. Uh, how, all, you know, the, the book, I think, takes its time a little more than the movie. The, in many ways, this is why it's tough for me to, to fully appreciate whether the movie is, is as successful as I think it is, or if it's just such a good Cliff's Notes of the book, which I'm very fond of, that, you know, that's that's why I uh, enjoy it so much. But I, I think all of the performances are, are fantastic, and Harry Dean Stanton isn't in it enough for my money, but it's fun when he shows up. But anyway, all of this culminates in a moment where uh, Dennis and Lee both agree that something is going on with Christine, that Christine has to be stopped uh, to try to save Arnie. And uh, so there's a big showdown in Darnell's garage with, you know, a bulldozer and and Christine. And it's just the best. Uh, so that is the plot of Christine. I've kind of mentioned along the way what I think works about the movie. And I, and I think it all does work really well. I think it's gorgeous. I think the the shots of Christine on fire chasing down Buddy Repperton and his pal are some of the best. Um, it borrows heavily from the book. A lot of the the dialogue and so forth is is clearly taken um, directly from the book. But I think the the script by Bill Phillips, who did uh, you know uh, uh, this and a movie called El Diablo and a movie called Physical Evidence and uh, Summer Solstice. Like, nothing that you would really call, like, oh, this is uh, his claim to fame. Like, Christine is maybe the most popular movie he ever did. Uh, maybe There Goes the Neighborhood, which is uh, a movie with Jeff Daniels and Catherine O'Hara from... Uh, the the early 90s, perhaps. But again, I mean, we're not talking about uh, a heavy hitter in terms of, of screenwriting. But I think the script is really good. and But mostly I think that's because um, he's just, you know, picking and choosing what bits of the book to, to insert in the movie. And some of the dialogue taken straight from there. And I think it works. Um, it feels very Stephen King. And... I think that's why I like it so much is because I am so fond of the book, watching Christine is like, oh yeah, this is exactly the movie that I would want made of this book. Um, I think it captures the friendship between Dennis and Arnie well. I think, uh, you know, the the kind of conspiracy between Dennis and Lee is a little rushed, uh, whereas in the book it's a little more like, oh... In addition to them trying to save Arnie, they realize that they are attracted to one another and, and sort of fall in love. Uh, and you don't really get a lot of that, which is kind of a bummer. But, you know, uh, there are like little minor complaints here and there I have. But watching Christine again, 
I just am blown away by like I love the music, I love the visuals, I love these characters. Um, as silly as the haunted car premise is, and the way that it like communicates through the music that it's playing, that like you keep when Dennis tries to break into Christine, you get Little Richard singing. Uh, you keep on knocking, but you can't come in, and that kind of thing. It's and and the same thing happens when Buddy Rupert and his guys show up. Only when the the radio plays, they continue to bust Christine up, and uh, uh, up up to and until the radio kind of dies. So I think all that stuff is just so good. It, it it's just so much fun. Um, and yeah, if you've never seen Christine. I just can't recommend it highly enough. I think it's a really underrated Carpenter film. Um, but I, again, I fully reserve the right to be wrong about this just because I, I am so fond of the movie and the book and the performances and all of that stuff. I, I think it's terrific. Uh, I think Christine is incredibly successful at what it's setting out to do. And even though Carpenter himself doesn't seem to care that much about the, the movie Christine. Maybe he does, but you know, in interviews, he's, he's sort of been dismissive of it in his, uh, his filmography, you know, su suggesting that was the movie I, he needed to make at the time to make himself, you know, a credible and viable, uh, filmmaker. But I think it's very good. Uh, I think it's very stylish. I think it feels like a Carpenter movie. I mean, it starts with John Carpenter's Christine, and I think it is a wonderful marriage of Carpenter and King. Uh, and I would have loved to have seen more of those collaborations. You know, I think uh, they both have very um, interesting visions of what horror is. And I love, one of my favorite things in the world is to listen to John Carpenter talk about horror and the philosophy behind it and, and behind some of his own work. And uh, I think hearing him uh, and King talk about those things, I think they're of a, a similar stripe. And they, they come from that kind of rock and roll background as well. They're both a little punk rock, uh, which is also great. And they both love westerns. So I would love to see a Stephen King penned horror western directed by John Carpenter. That would be moi, chef's kiss. Uh, so anyway, that is it for Christine. I... You know, I gush over it. I think it's terrific. I think you should watch it if you've never seen it, even if you have seen it. It's just a great movie. Uh, once the the sun goes down and uh, the Halloween night falls, uh, it's great to you know kick back on on the sofa or in your favorite chair and let Christine happen to you. And you know the fact that it starts with the rumble of the engine, uh, not unlike George Miller's. Fury Road to sort of let you know, like, oh, things are about to get started. And it does. It, it kicks right off. So, uh, again, I think it's a terrific film, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you would like to let me know your thoughts on Christine, by all means, drop by our Discord channel. Uh, or if you want to go to legionpodcasts.com, you can find the post for this here episode. And uh, on that uh, post, you will see links to all of the various Legion Podcast social media channels. I uh, hang out on the Discord quite a bit. So if you want to reach me, that is probably the best way, although I check in with the uh, the Facebook stuff uh, periodically as well. And if you are listening to this on the Legion Podcast uh, podcast feed, the RSS, uh, the, the, uh, the podcast channel um, on the podcast catcher of your choice, uh, I implore you, I, I beg of you, uh, please, uh, you should subscribe to The Dark Parade as well. That is the show I do on the weekly. And coming up here pretty soon, we'll be back on the weekly schedule instead of the, the daily drops with all this 31 Days of Halloween stuff. So uh, I hope you, uh, I entreat you, I implore you uh, to come by and check that show out as well. And of course, be sure you are subscribing to the Legion Podcasts uh, podcast feed where you get this show, a couple of others I do, and many, many others. Uh, I'm already running long on this episode, so I won't list all those uh, at the moment, but uh, there are a bunch, and I think you would like at least some of them, if not all of them. You know, everybody's got their own taste. I'm not going to say you're, you're going to like everything, but you're going to like a lot of it, and most of it. If you're of a similar nature to myself, you probably will like all of it. So 
Uh, I'm quite fond of all of the shows on Legion Podcast. At any rate, that is going to do it for October 29th. Have yourself a great time trick-or-treating. Uh, be sure that if you are handing out candy, don't don't scrimp, you know? Like, if you're not going to do the full candy bars, I understand some people are, it's a little pricey. You're not going to do the full candy bars. Make sure if you're handing out the fun size, it's a couple, right? Like, not one fun size a piece. You get a handful, handful in each bucket, in each bag. Don't be chintzy. It's Halloween. You only do this once a year. Uh, if you're out there trick-or-treating, have a great time. Have a safe time. Be especially spooky out there as you're trick-or-treating. And uh, we'll be back here tomorrow with uh, the 30th of our 31 movies on this here 31 Days of Halloween. See you then. Oh,